सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुली द कलर ऑफ वायलेंट डेथ एच इट सेल्फ ओवर दिटीज डस्टी रोज पिंक वॉल्स सोकिंग दिविड फैब्रिक्स लाइनिंग द जोहरी बाजार and the brightly colored icons on the wall of the Hanuman temple the message of the massacre was crafted in black text on a flickering white computer screen at a nearby cyber cafe the bombing the email from the perpetrators read was meant to teach the kofari hind or indian infidels that if islam and muslims in this country are not safe then the light of your safety will also go off 15 years after that murderous 2008 indian mujahideen attack on jaipur which claimed 63 lives the rajasthan high court has acquitted four men earlier sentenced to death for the bombing justice samir jain and justice pankaj bhandari based their judgment on compelling evidence that the prosecution relied on fabricated documents and false testimony the judgment is bad news for a string of terrorism cases pending against several of the same suspects some of which like the serial bombings in ahmedabad have led to death penalties being delivered during trials and others which are progressing slower than glaciers in some of those cases like the varanasi and mumbai attacks there are credible reasons to fear that the wrong people may have been scapegoated even while the real perpetrators do in custody have not been prosecuted the rajasthan high court is the first appellate court to subject an indian mujahideen case to rigorous scrutiny and if other acquittals follow there will be a compelling case for a thorough going judicial review of this whole investigation the judges have described the case as an institutional failure This isn't the first case to suffer due to the failure of investigation agencies and if things are allowed to continue the way they are this certainly won't be the last observed justice jain the rajasthan high court discovered the police had made a series of darkly comedic efforts to prove their case the police produced a bill for the cycle mohammad saif was alleged to have purchased to plant the bomb recording its frame number as 97908 the cycle used in the bombing though was number 30616 to make things worse the bill bore signs of obvious forgery even though every other bill issued by the anju cycle company bore grooves where it was torn off the page this single one was mysteriously smooth faced with the significant problem that the cycle shop seemed to have issued the bill a day before the bombing when the suspects were not in the city someone seemed to have simply changed the date in ink on the carbon copy produced in court in cross examination the owner of the cycle shop said that he recognized mohammad saif from a mark on his face in an earlier identification parade conducted by a magistrate though saif was not recorded to have any marks on his face Local salesperson Vinod Kumar Giri, moreover, said there were no distinguishing masks on Saif's face. Almost incredibly, investigators never seized and studied user records or the central processing unit at the Naveen Cafe, from where the Indian Mujahideen had sent its claim of responsibility. The police did submit a site plan of the premises, but that site plan never showed there was a computer there. even though the trial judge who first heard the case proved willing to overlook the problems with the prosecution case justices jain and bhandari proved somewhat less accommodating the embarrassed state government has said it will appeal the judgment but new evidence is not going to mysteriously appear to help it make its case the prosecution story may be true the supreme court noted in a famous 1957 judgment but between may be true and must be true there is inevitably a long distance to travel 
and the whole of this distance must be covered by legal, reliable and unimpeachable evidence. Like most Indian Mujahideen cases, the Jaipur bombing investigation centered around a dead man, alleged Indian Mujahideen commander Mohammad Atif Amin, who was shot dead by the Delhi police at an apartment in the city's Batla House neighborhood in September 2008. Amin was alleged to have commanded the terror cell, which staged a series of bombings from February 2005 onwards, including attacks in New Delhi. The central figure in the Jaipur prosecution, Mohammad Saif, is alleged to have been part of a group of Azamgarh residents recruited by Amin and other core Indian Mujahideen leaders to help actually stage the bombings. The son of a minor Azamgarh politician and a graduate of the Shibli College and Purvanchal University, Saif allegedly survived the firing at Batla House by hiding in the bathroom of the apartment. In purported confessional testimony to the National Investigation Agency, which cannot be used for the purposes of his trial but has been obtained by the print, alleged Indian Mujahideen bomb maker Muhammad Zarar Siddhi Bapa, also known as Yasin Bhatkal, said he provided wood cased claymore mines, which Amin then passed on to his recruits for the bombing. According to prosecutors, Amin and nine other volunteers, including Saif, boarded a bus to Jaipur from Delhi's Bikaner house on the morning of the bombing. They were provided 3,000 rupees each by Amin, the prosecution claimed, to purchase a bicycle on which to plant the devices. That evening, about half an hour after the explosions, the men returned to Delhi by train using assumed names. The police did not trouble themselves though with producing the tickets used for these journeys or locating witnesses who might have remembered seeing the men during their travels. There was no CCTV footage either to prove the claim, nor forensic evidence of the kind that was successfully used in the prosecution of an Indian Mujahideen bombing in New Delhi. Egregious disinterest in the truth though has scarred police investigations of the Indian Mujahideen cases from the outset. For example, even the NIA is on judicial record stating that the 2006 bombing may not have been conducted by Kamal Sheikh, Faisal Ansari, Etisham Siddiqui, Naved Khan and Asif Khan, all of whom are facing death sentences for their role in the attacks. The NIA stated in court in a document that the bombings were carried out by Indian Mujahideen operatives other than the convicts, which obviously means they couldn't also have done it. The Mumbai crime branch actually filed a charge sheet indicting key Indian Mujahideen operative Sadiq Israr Sheikh, since separately convicted in the Indian Mujahideen's Ahmedabad bombing case for the 7-11 train bombings. The crime branch charge sheet is yet to be heard by a court though, and appeals by those convicted have not yet been heard. Varanasi resident Mohammad Waliullah again was blamed for the 2005 bombing of the Sankat Mochan temple, the terrorist group's first bombing. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the possession of an assault rifle, grenades and plastic explosives, but not for the attack itself. The actual perpetrators believed in successive police cases to be part of Amin's group were never prosecuted for their horrible crime. Two Kashmiri men were wrongly blamed for yet another Indian Mujahideen attack executed in Delhi. They were exonerated in 2017 and despite the evidence that's piled up, the original perpetrators have not been prosecuted. Little mystery actually remains on the origins and course of the Indian Mujahideen, mainly because the group's members have told their own story in public. Abu Rashid Ahmad, among the key members of Amin's network, together with other Indian Mujahideen operatives, even appeared in an Islamic State video claiming responsibility for several bombings. The failure of state police forces to secure credible prosecutions, though, has bred conspiracy theories and fueled claims that law enforcement is simply using terrorism as a pretext to persecute innocent 
Muslim victims. From the words of the Indian Mujahideen, it is evident that justice was among the issues which enabled the jihadist group to recruit so many volunteers. The perpetrators of violence against Muslims in communal riots across India, the Jaipur Jihad Manifesto noted, had rarely faced criminal trial. Even though there were thousands of killings in Mumbai after 1993 or in Gujarat after 2002, just a handful of perpetrators were ever tried. Terrorists who staged revenge attacks, the Jaipur Manifesto complained, were even being brought back from different countries of the world. But there wasn't a uniform standard of justice and that let the jihadists capitalize. The Rajasthan acquittal makes it imperative for India's criminal justice system to admit to mistakes made in the past and begin setting old wrongs right. At the print, we believe in non-hyphenated, high-quality journalism that's fair and questioning. Our exceptional ground reporting is something we're very proud of. All of this, though, comes at a huge cost. To encourage us and support our work, I request you to please opt for a paid subscription. You will be able to see the process on our screen by following the link in the description of this video. We are also launching a host of exclusive benefits for you like priority passes to our webinars and on-ground events, opportunities to get your articles published in our U-turn section and some especially curated newsletters. So please support our work and click on the link in the description below to subscribe. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. Thank you for watching Security Code.